Well, I love looking around here and seeing all of you beautiful queens and princesses, whatever you relate to the most. Maybe you're a princess at heart or you're, you're that woman that is, I'm a queen, right? I like looking out and seeing all of you. And, um, you know, the, the, the slogan for this year for Living Word Bible Church Women's Ministry is the unity of us is the strength of us. And as I look around, I think how delighted God has to be right now as his daughters gather in one place tonight to sit under his word and to just enjoy worship with him and enjoy fellowship with one another. Amen. So let's just start off with prayer. Father God, I thank you and I praise you tonight. We gather here together tonight, Father, as sisters who love you, as friends who love you, Father, and we just commit this entire night to you, Lord God. And right now, I hand over the willingness to teach tonight what you would have us hear from your word in the name of Jesus. And I offer it up to you, Father, and I just um, declare all of you, Holy Spirit, just speak. I thank you right now that our hearts have already been prepared to receive the word that we each individually need to hear as we go forward in the evening. I thank you and I praise you and we pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. If you brought your Bibles, and um, just go ahead and open them up to Jeremiah 31.3. And um, I don't really even think I get to that verse for a while. But it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I think it's just awesome to have your Bible open to that endearment. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Um, so when I was in college, I, um, I remember being in a communications class. And um, it was the very first year. It was my first semester there. And um, I just remember this young girl sat next to me. And she seemed very quiet. She seemed very, very shy maybe a little introverted. And I actually thought, she's probably really super smart <laughs> and just really focused on this class and focused on studying. But she seemed very, um, just kind of um, unengaging, very to herself. And I remember as the class progressed, she stayed that same way. But there was a one pivotal week. And I want to say it was probably like, I don't know, week five, week six, it was like halfway into the semester. And all of a sudden, in class, and just kind of getting everything settled and getting ready to listen to the lecture, and all of a sudden, this girl walks in, and she's laughing and giggling. And so much so, and kind of late, so it kind of drew attention to her, but she's laughing, she walks in. And you know, like in college, you don't have assigned seats necessarily, but you kind of have a tendency to sit in the same seat that maybe you sat in the first place. And so she plopped down into the, into the seat that she'd been in for the, all these weeks. And I looked over at her and she's like, hi. I thought, who in the world is this person? <laughs> it's not the same girl that had been there for four weeks, three weeks, five weeks. Well, as um, the semester progressed, we had a couple opportunities to share. She would ask me if she could borrow my notes. And, and then there was a couple times where, you know, we had in-class conversations and we had to like share. It was so crazy because this person that went from not engaging, not participating, went into this totally different mode. And now all of a sudden she would like volunteer her own ideas and volunteer suggestions and volunteer answers. She asked for notes. She laughed if she thought something was funny. It was like a crazy 360. I was like, who is this person? Well, over the course of kind of getting to know her a little bit more, she shared what she shared her story. She said, you know, I'm, I'm from Arizona. And she's like, but um, I dated a guy all through high school, all four years, thought we would get married. Um, but we both decided at the end of high school, since we were going each our separate ways into different colleges, that we would go ahead and take a break. And she's like, I just, I saw myself married to this guy. I'd, I'd given four years of my high school life to him. I saw myself marrying him and starting a family with him. And she said, but we made a decision. We're going to, you know, long distance relationships are not that great. So we went our separate ways. She's like, but I always thought that, you know, it would just, we would meet back up later after we graduated. And she said, 
two weeks into each of our respective college semesters, he started dating somebody else exclusively. And she said, my world fell apart. She's like, I was heartbroken. I thought, how could you love me all that time and then you just find somebody else? And she said, I wanted to go home. I didn't want to be here. I didn't like what I was doing. I didn't like my roommate. Nothing made me happy. And she's like, I just, I was miserable. And you know what? It showed. And I'm looking at her and I said, wow, is that where this you has been all that time? And she said, recently, um, she had met somebody in college. And this person started out as somebody that she just would study with, um, had a, a similar class with her, and they would just study, and he was kind of tutoring her. And it developed into a romance. And she was like, I can't see myself going home now. I can't see myself leaving. She's like, I, I, I never knew that that wasn't the one for me. And I share that story because I want to make a point. She didn't do anything to her outer her. She didn't change her hairstyle. She didn't come in with different makeup. She didn't come in with a different outfit on. It was the same woman. But there was something that happened on the inside, and all of a sudden, she was a completely different, vibrant, radiant her. Women, we become more naturally beautiful when we know we are loved. There is something inside of a woman when you know that you're loved, that inside of you, it's like it bubbles out and, and it can't help but flow onto everyone around you. And some of you may have even seen this yourself. Maybe this has been you at a time or two. You take someone who maybe has been walking through some rejection or is not being pursued and you're feeling just, oh. and we look at that woman and, and we see you know, it's almost like as if there's a, this beautiful flower and she's not being tended to anymore and she's not being watered. Like there's a light inside of her that's been turned off. But you take that same exact woman pursued by love and all of a sudden there's this radiant countenance that comes out of her and flows out of her and onto everyone around her. It's almost as if her heart woke up it's almost as if her heart has now bloomed and blossomed and blossomed and it comes to the surface and it's it's wanting to be heard and wanting to be seen. The countenance inside of her now becomes and beams radiant. We wonder where has she been all this time because you know looking at her she's really lovely. She's really stunning. She's actually very captivating in her own right in her own beauty without changing anything. We see it in movies all the time, right? One of the examples that I think of that automatically comes to my mind is in the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Right, have you seen it? Okay. And we've got the character Tula, right? And you know, at first when we meet her, she's a little awkward in her own skin, right? I'm not gonna say she's not bold because she's, she kind of knows what she wants. She's very smart, but she's kind of bossed around and she kind of seems to get a little stepped on, right? Again, she's not really sure if like it's okay to be who she is and she isn't really sure if she likes who she is, right? Kind of wants to change some things, is a little afraid to change some things. But what happens when she starts to be pursued by Ian? All of a sudden, she starts to, she starts to wear her own, her own style. We see this confidence in her. We see this, this bubbling and this blossoming and this blooming in this character who was once a little plain and maybe seemingly unengaging. What happened, right? What happened to her to have this transformation? Well, we long for romance. Matter of fact, we're wired for it. We are wired for romance. We desire to be swept off our feet. And I want you to follow me full circle here because some of you might be thinking, I'm not a mushy-gushy kind of girl. And I want you to follow me because I'm going to take it full circle because, uh-huh, you, you desire to be swept off your feet. You do desire to be swept off your feet. What happened to each one of the women, the one that was in college with me and then Tula in the movie, what happened to them is merely the power of romance released their true beauty and awoke their heart. It woke up the heart that was inside of them. 
The power of romance, releasing that inner thing that was already inside of them there all along. And she's come alive. As women, we long to be loved in a certain way. We long to be loved in a way unique to our own femininity. And this is why I wanted you to, to stay with me here. We're all created different and unique. We're all very, very diverse. So that femininity in one woman might come out and look different in another woman. And understand when I say femininity, I'm not saying at the sacrifice of being strong and intelligent and brave and bold and a little bit sassy. How about funny and witty? You see, we can be swept, our fi- swept off of our feet or have the desire to be romanced without it being at the sacrifice of being strong woman. Amen? I'm a strong woman, but I love being swept off my feet. Matter of fact, most of the movies that we love, most of the movies that maybe make us really truly gasp or make us really sigh, or the ones that are most memorable to us are the ones where the heroine is like the most strong, um, bold, brave, crazy little sassy character. One of my very favorite characters in a movie is Danielle from Ever After. Have any, has anyone seen the movie Ever After? I love that version of Cinderella. I love that my daughter will be raised with that version of Cinderella because she's a strong woman. But guess what? That prince walks in and he sweeps her off her feet. Not at the sacrifice of being strong, but in addition to all of those amazing, amazing qualities. Um, so it was right, be- right at Christmas time. Scott went out, my husband went out, and he bought this really big giant, I don't know how many feet it was, but it was really big. It was like over the fence, and it was a big blow-up snowman. And we're all outside, and we're watching this snowman um, be, you know, blowed up, blown up, tethered to the stakes and the wall, (laughs) anything that would hold it, because it was massive. And we're all gathered out there, all my boys and the girlfriends, and Savvy comes walking out, and um, my my 17-year-old son, he was actually lounging in the grass, and Savannah walks right out to where he's at, and, you know, we're watching this snowman go up, and all of a sudden, she just starts screaming. She falls on the grass, she clutches her leg, literally next to her brother, and have you ever done it? Have you ever been in a, in a scene, it's like slow-mo, where you go, what? is going on. And so we all did that. And I just, in my mind, my memory, if my memory serves, we just all went like this. And we all kind of gathered around her and she's clutching her foot and she's screaming like she lost a limb. And she stops mid scream. And she's like, what are you people staring at? Do something. I got stung by a bee. Call 911. Scott scoops her up, he runs in the house, he props her on the couch, and he proceeds to take the stinger out. She did get stung by a bee between her toes. Exactly, she had a reason to be screaming, on, rolling on the grass like a crazy girl. But I walked in, and here she is propped up on the couch, her leg is propped up on pillows. She's got an ice pack on her toe. Daddy's removed the stinger. Now, she's very bold and sassy, but you know what? The hero whisked in and saved the day. Somewhere deep inside of you, down deep inside of you maybe, you feel it. Your creator designed you with a desire to be pursued by love. Maybe the hero in your dreams isn't going to come riding in with full body armor on a white horse to whisk you away to a castle. Maybe instead the hero of your dreams is going to come in clad in leather on a chrome Harley and whisk you away to some crazy sunset. I don't know. <laughs> but here's what I want you to ponder. And maybe, maybe you have, and you need to be reminded of it. Or maybe you've never known this. Or thought you had the freedom to, to think of this. But this doesn't need to wait for a man. This idea or this concept of being swept off our feet or pursued by romance, it doesn't need to wait for a man. All you single ladies that are waiting for the man, that's great. Keep praying for him. But you can know and you can feel 
what it feels to be pursued in romance by love without that man right now. And maybe you've been married, and you married the wrong guy, and then you got rid of the wrong guy. (laughs) And maybe you're sitting out there tonight, and you're waiting for the right guy. Well, again, keep believing and keep praying, but I want you to know, you can know what it feels like to be pursued by love without that man right now. Maybe you're happily married, and you're like, you know what, Pastor Holly, I want to be swept off my feet again. (laughs) You, too, can know what it means to be romanced by the king because you already have the relentless love of a king in King Jesus. You are already being pursued by love in King Jesus. Let's go back to some movies, some, some blockbusters out there, and let's think of some scenes that maybe have made us sigh or made us like, aw. How about um, in the Titanic, Jack and Rose, they're on the bow of the ship, okay? Yeah, we all make fun of how that one was, like how he's holding her and, you know, she's feeling like she can fly. What about, uh, one of my favorites is William Wallace, his love for Muran, as he speaks first in French to her and then he switches to Italian, says, none as great, none as beautiful as you, right? Or what about, maybe you're more of an Aragorn person um, as he's declaring his passionate love for Arwen on that bridge under the moonlit sky, right? Those scenes that cause us to go, oh, to be swept off our feet. I have a question. When you think of that, maybe none of those, but I want you to think of a scene that causes you pause or makes you sigh or makes you feel, oh, that would make me feel so loved. Can you put yourself in the position of the heroine, of the beauty in that scene, opposite Jesus as the hero, as the lover? What does your heart do with that right now? Is there something in you thinking, "Uh, can she say that? Is it okay for me to think of him that way? As my lover? As the lover of my heart? As the romancer? Maybe there's some of you and you're thinking, gosh, I would love that. I could really use that. We prayed over our hearts when we came in because something inside me knew that we need to be completely open and hand our hearts over with reckless abandon because the enemy loves to bring up all the reasons why your heart's not worthy of being pursued and romanced by the king. And maybe there's some fear in you and you're like, I don't even know how to offer my heart because I have these walls up that are intended to keep me safe and protect me. But the problem with that is it keeps out, you know, the romancer, the one who loves your heart the one who loves you with everything in him. So here's the thing. I'm not going to read these scriptures. Um, I'm just going to tell you what they are because there's a lot of them. Um, In Matthew 9, in Matthew 25, in John 3, in Luke, in Ephesians, in Revelation, all of those books hold scriptures where Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. All of those scriptures are scriptures where Jesus calls himself the bridegroom and you and I are the bride. You know what bridegroom means? It literally means fiance and or lover. Jesus himself says he's the lover of your heart. Jesus himself says, you belong to me. You're my fiance. I'm your fiance. And here's the problem when the enemy wants to step in and rob us of the ability to see that. We have to say, no, I'm not going to allow religion to keep me from stepping into something bigger than me. We have to take off any religious thinking, any religious draping that would not allow ourselves to see him as the bridegroom and ourselves as the bride. And here's something I want to pose to you. And this hit me really hard as I was reading through this. And I don't have a problem seeing him as my bridegroom, as my bridegroom or as my, the lover of my heart. But I never really, he just took me to a deeper place. And, and here's what, what the Holy Spirit showed me. Is that the picture of Jesus, the lover, the bridegroom, the fiance, 
to the bride, us, the church, is supposed to be the model and the example for which all earthly marriages um, duplicate. That's the picture of how earthly marriages should be. You can go ahead and clap at that. That's amazing. It's not the other way around. It starts with him and his love and his passionate desire and romance of you and I. That is to be the picture of what earthly marriages duplicate. But if we can't see him in that role, how do we ever enjoy those relationships? How do we ever truly have the kingdom relationship? If we don't first agree, that's the role. It's the most intimate of metaphors that Jesus chooses to use to describe his love and his longing for you and I and the kind of relationship that he invites us into. And the word is filled with all kinds of metaphors used between God and us. Potter and the clay, sheep and the shepherd. Amen? But this one, bridegroom and bride, is the most stunning, is the most stunning and breathtaking is when God says he's our lover and we are his bride. So here's the thing. God has been wooing you and I since we were little girls, and he's passionately pursuing you still today. But do we know this? Do we get up every day and look to see evidence of this? So tonight, I'm going to share. I spent more time on my opening. I always do that. So here we go. You are crowned with a promise, but right now I want to show you four ways that you are romanced by the king. And the first way is through beauty. You know, God's version of flowers and chocolates and candlelight dinners comes in the form of sunsets. It comes in the forms of, form of stars in the, in the dark sky. It comes in the form of oceans, waves going in and out. How many of us love to just let that lull us into just a quietness? Amen. How about the big saguaro cactus? So many people seem think that that is just so pretty to see the big saguaro cactus and all its symbolism and you know how it, it tells us the age and how long it's been there. What about mountains? And what about vibrant flowers, right? Maybe you're one of those sunset selfie girls that pulls off the side of the road and you take like a picture of the sunset because you just are like... <gasps> It causes you awe, and it causes you to stop whatever you're doing. Half of you are in rush hour traffic when you take these selfies. I'm like, man, she's passionate about the sunset. (laughs) What about mountains and then valleys? You know what I think is so so amazing and, and, and shows God's passion for us is he's got massive diversity in this world that he placed us in. And why? You know, here's, the, here's what I was thinking as I was walking through this. I thought, you know, how many of you have seen futuristic film after futuristic film, and it shows, like, it's very dark and gloomy and robotic, and it shows gears, and it just shows, like, metal, right? Like, God needed our help in the technological advances. Like, I'm thinking, he, he already knows all of that, right? But it kind of shows that we go from this beautiful, vibrant world to, like, you know, man's so smart. So now we're going to be over here in this, like, you know, I don't know, modern age. And it's very impersonal, and it's very, like, just ugly. <laughs> and I think, and it made me think, why this world? And then it, it was awesome because I kind of started thinking, you know, I, I often tease that I um, should have been born on the East Coast because I love the moisture, I love the green, I love the flowers out there. But here I am, I'm a native to Arizona, right? But man, we have the prettiest big open blue sky. And when you fly into Sky Harbor, it's like you can breathe. It's like, ah. Oh. But... I woke up the other morning to an overcast day. How many of you, Tuesday, I think it was? It was kind of windy. It was a little chilly, but there was this smell of rain. And I was putting this, I was been studying this, and I've been putting it together, and I thought, oh my gosh, he is showing me some love today. I love the smell of rain. Do we stop long enough to look at the different aspects of where we're at right now and pay attention to why something is beautiful specifically to you versus something else? Why do you get excited about a rainbow 
Somebody posted a rainbow on Instagram, and I thought, I missed that. You know why I missed it? Because, I don't know, I don't, rainbows don't do anything for me. But it did, somebody, it did something for someone that, that took a picture. You know what that is? That is God paying attention to you through beauty. Why have a diverse world? Why not just pop us down in like, you know, the gear shift of like the futuristic world? Instead, he created a beautiful world. He placed you in a beautiful world. And he said, here you go. I love you. You love little spiky critters of the desert. Awesome. (laughs) People find beauty in that. People appreciate that. Why do we appreciate different things? Because your God created you different, and he can't put us in one same spot. He's got to put us in a vast world full of beauty so that we can explore and travel and feel loved on by him. The second way that we are romanced by the king is through worship. In uh, the book of Luke, in, in chapter 10, verse 38, we read the story of Mary and Martha. Okay, Jesus has come to dinner, and Mary made, or Martha made some heck of a spread because she, the story is that she works the entire time. She's just working, 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 doesn't stop. And Mary just pops herself right in front of Jesus, and she's just sitting at his feet. And she's just sitting there listening to him. She's got the prince. She's got a prince in her house. She's got this king. Actually, it's not even the prince. It's the king of kings in her house. And she's sitting there, and she's listening to him. And then Martha gets very angry because she's working really, really hard, and apparently she's been working a lot. And so she actually says something to Mary. And Jesus, what does Jesus do? Jesus says to her, Martha, leave Mary alone. I'm paraphrasing. She's chosen the right thing. What did Mary choose that was the right thing? She chose worship. She chose intimacy. She sat before the king And she just wanted to sit in his presence and and just be in awe, be in full, utter devotion to him. You know, God wants intimacy with me and you. But here's the problem. Intimacy takes two people. In order to get it from him, I have to give it to him. And he wants us to enter into that worship with him. The word says that we are to love others. And we're to serve others. But the greatest commandment is love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. See, he wants us to love other people, but he first wants us to love him. He wants us to pay attention to him. He wants us to have our hearts completely and wholly devoted to loving on him. And here's something really, really powerful. You know when you enter into that worship chamber where it's just you and him, no one else is allowed in there because you're you and that worship, that intimate moment isn't for anyone else. It's just nobody can enter into that chamber of worship other than you and him. Their chamber of worship is between him and them. When you enter into that, only you can bring the heart that you're giving to him. Nobody else can give the heart that you're offering to Jesus, just you. Intimate worship with you. And here's the thing. I think sometimes we, we give our heart away to so many other things. Movies, shopping, food, sometimes gossip. It's limitless what we'll give our hearts away to. Jesus loves it when we offer our hearts to him, when we offer our complete devotion to him. He's the only one truly worthy of our heart's devotion. He wants us to draw close. He's waiting for us. He wants your love. The the third way is through protection. You know what the favor of God does? The favor of God protects our destiny and our dreams. The favor of God puts the right people in front of us so that we can step out and into what he has called us to do on this earth. Protection. Another example, I think of Braveheart again. We see William Wallace and what he'll go to, the great lengths that he'll go to in that movie to protect people's right to live and to dream in a safe environment. To walk out what they've been 
called to do and accomplish. The word says in Psalm, it says, um, though a thousand may fall on one side and 10,000 on the other side, no harm will be done to you. Part of being swept, up, swept off our feet in romance is being whisked out of harm's way. Your king wants you to know he is fiercely protective of you. He is fiercely guarding you. And the last way tonight that I want to share, we are romanced by the king through his word. The Bible from front to back is a love letter from God to you and me. From the romancer of our heart, from, the, from start to finish, it's a love letter to, both, to all of us. Um, I'm gonna, I want to read from the Song of Songs. I remember as a young child, how many of you remember or ever sat under like, you know, scripture coming out of Song of Songs and you're like, it makes you blush, right? Well, I'm going to make us blush because I'm going to read, not only am I going to read from Song of Psalms, but I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. Wow. <laughs> Talk about hot and steamy. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I want you to um, close your eyes because this book, many people think that the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon or Book of Songs um, is, many have a belief that it's for physical marriages, earthly marriages. It's what we should, you know, use um, or pattern our marriages after. But um, it really is specifically the book Bridegroom to the bride. It is specifically Jesus, God, to us. So I want to read, and I'm going to read out of Song of Songs 2, 10 through 15. And this is from the bridegroom. Just close your eyes as I read this. I want you to really picture it. Arise, my dearest. Hurry, my darling. Come along with me. I have come as you have asked to draw you to my heart and to lead you out. For now is the time, my very beautiful one. The season has changed and the bondage of your barren winter has ended and the season of hiding is over and it's gone. The rains have soaked the earth and left it bright with blossoming flowers. The season for pruning the vines has arrived and I hear the cooing of doves in our land, feeling the air with songs to awaken you and guide you forth. Can you not discern this new day of destiny breaking forth all around you? The early signs of my purposes and plans are bursting forth. The budding vines of new life are now blooming everywhere. The fragrance of flowers whispers. There's change in the air. Arise, my love, my beautiful companion, and please run with me to the higher place. For now is the time to arise and come away with me. For you are my dove, hidden in the split open rock. It is I who took you and hid you up high in the secret stairway of the sky. Let me see your radiant face and hear your sweet voice. How beautiful your eyes of worship and lovely your voice in prayer. You must catch the troubling foxes, those sly little foxes that hinder our relationship. For they raid our budding vineyard of love to ruin what I've planted within you. Will you catch them and remove them for me? Actually, let's do that together. I'm going to read again. I want to go from Song of Songs 4.1 through 5 again from our bridegroom. Listen, my dearest darling, you are so beautiful. You are beauty itself to me. Your eyes glisten with love like gentle doves behind your veil. What devotion I see each time I gaze upon you. When I look at you, I see that you have taken my fruit and tasted my word, and your life has become clean and pure, like a lamb washed and newly shorn. You now show grace and balance with truth on display. The words of your mouth are as refreshing as an oasis. What pleasure you bring to me. I see your inner strength so stately and strong. You are as secure as David's fortress. Your virtues and grace cause a thousand famous soldiers to surrender to your beauty. I think that that is so pretty, <laughs> right? It's like poetry. And you and I are to be the recipients of that love letter. 
And sometimes I think we make God feel like he's stuck in a romantic comedy series where the main characters know they're destined to be together, but they allow the enemy to rob them of that. And so it's kind of on again, off again, wishy-washy. Your king is relentlessly in pursuit of you every single day. He loves you. He loves you with the most amazing, beautiful love that, that you could ever desire. The enemy wants to come in and he wants to rob you. He wants to say, you've messed up too big too many times. He wants to come in and he wants to put shame and, and lack of worth on us and on our hearts and make us feel like we're not worthy of that. <laughs> We have to give in to the pursuit of that relentless king. And we have to tell the enemy that he can no longer trip us up. And here's the reason why. We have to spend a little bit more time on the inside of us rather than on the outside of us. I'm going to tell you why. Because see, go ahead, clap, yes. (laughs) You know why? Because this inner beauty thing, that true beauty thing, it's it's an inside of us thing. It's an inside of a woman thing. It's a soulish thing. And the enemy knows that if he can get in and if he can attack that thing inside of you with all the reasons why you're not good enough and not worthy enough. See, here's the thing. It's not what you look like. It's not what you do. It's about who you are and whose you are. Right? Who are you in here? Do you belong to the king of kings? Does he get your heart? We have to take off the old garments in exchange for his garments. We have to say yes to the dress. We have to say yes to the dress, the white dress, the unblemished dress, the gorgeous dress, the dress that's fitting for a king, the dress that's fitting for the king that's already in pursuit of you and who has been since you've been created. You have been his thought and on his mind. Ladies, beauty flows from a heart at rest. You know, I don't ever remember hearing a description of Mary in the Bible. But when I picture that whole whole scene of Mary resting at the feet of Jesus, I see a woman without wrinkle. I see her just refreshed. I see her eyes bright and sparkling. I see a big, wide open, true, honest smile on her face. I see these these eyes that are just in awe of her relentless king that's sitting in front of her. That king who's so handsome. That's what I that's the picture I get of Mary. Beauty flows from a heart that's resting in him and listening and taking him in and saying, "I am all yours." I want to conclude with this. Give in to the bridegroom's pursuit of you. And please trust when he speaks these words. I have gathered you from my heart. I have have gathered from your heart, my equal, my bride. I have gathered from my garden all my sacred spices, even my myrrh. I have tasted and enjoyed my wine within you. I have tasted with pleasure my pure milk, my honeycomb, which you yield to me. I delight in gathering my sacred spice, all the fruits of my life that I have gathered from within you, my paradise. Come, all my friends, look at my bride. All you revelers of my palace, feast on her. Look at her. Drink and drink and drink until you can take no more. Drink the wine of her love. Take all you desire, you priests. My life within her will become your feast. That life inside of her that's now able to, that love that he's placed inside of her, it's now flowing out. And it's flowing onto those that come into contact with her. Trust those words. And I want us to be able to say this in return to our bridegroom. I've made up my mind until the darkness disappears and the dawn has fully come, in spite of shadows and fears, I will go to the mountaintop with you. I will climb with you the mountain of suffering love and the hill of burning incense, because yes, I will be your bride. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Do you desire to know that romance inside? Do you want to be swept off your feet by the king? Because he so desires to romance you. And it's not like he hasn't tried because this book has been around for a long time. Allow yourself to give in to his pursuit. Allow him to step in and to show you how beautiful you are. Don't allow yourself anymore to be robbed of the opportunity to be swept off your feet right now while you're waiting for what God has for you in, in, in physical. I truly, truly believe that as we enter into that intimate chamber, that intimate worship of him, I really, really believe in that fulfillment. I believe he's gonna step in and he's gonna fill any holes in your heart. And you're gonna be so at rest, but at the same time, so loved, feel so excited by the amount of love that you feel from him. So let's just pray right now. Father God, I thank you and I praise you. I thank you for your passionate and your relentless love of us, Father God. And I say thank you that you try and try and that you never give up. I thank you and I praise you that you will keep, keep on pursuing us, Father God. I pray right now and I plead the blood of Jesus anywhere where the enemy thinks that he can rob the beautiful brides of knowing what their worth and their value is in you. I thank you and I praise you tonight. Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah, Father. And as we go forth in the next week and the next days and as we just continue to walk through our month, I thank you and I praise you, Lord, that you're going to continue to reveal to us the ways in which you're loving on us. I thank you, Father God, that you're already preparing ways to show us how much we mean to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray encouragement and empowerment on every single woman here, Father. I pray that you will awaken within women who have said no to that unique femininity inside of them. I, I pray right now, Father God, a blessing on that part of every woman in here in the name of Jesus right now. An enemy anywhere where you've been able to make a woman feel like she has to hide that part of her heart in the name of Jesus right now. I just see that healthy and restored and healed in the name of Jesus, completely whole in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen.